from the Bible. And we're, we've been discussing Uranus and the great age of Aquarius, this new age that is coming and frightening so many people. But, you know, we've just come through a war and that has been basically the identity of the old age. And it would seem that if ever we needed Uranus and Christ consciousness and a new direction, it's now. And this is what it will bring. We were showing you last week that Uranus is a planet of complete unpredictability. What's going to happen is your life and the way you think is going to be turned totally upside down. Well, it's it, nothing you can do about it. it. You're going to have such radical changes in your life and in your thought patterns, and it's going to happen. It, it's, it's totally positive. I mean, that's what it does. That's the effect it has. And one of the interesting things was, we were talking about how last week when they did the Voyager 2 flyby of Uranus, they found that the part of Uranus that was facing the sun was colder than the part that was facing away from it. And they still haven't been able to figure it out. You know? And yet this is a, this is a fact. And, and so we have this total unpredictability. And there was a whole shakeup in an existing scientific thought because Uranus betrayed the fact that when you're facing the sun, you should be warmer than when you're in the shade. The fact was, here it was facing the sun is the cold part, the shady part is the warm part. See? And the interesting and exciting thing was that this total unpredictability came with the planet of total unpredictability and changes and shakeups and, and thinking and thought, Uranus. Now, people of uh, what they call a Uranian nature, if we would, uh, many during uh, uh, the Aquarian time can be very harshly put down. And the reason that they will be put down is because Uranus comes for one thing, and that is to shake the status quo. And the status quo is Uranus' old adversary, Saturn. There's no, there's no way out of this thing. Uh, you know, people, there's a lot of people get upset with me. I had a woman say, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to support you, and I want to be on the TV network. The only thing is you criticize other religions or preachers, and she says, I don't think you should do that. But I had to write it back. I said, well, I can't really take your offering, and I really don't want, you know, <coughs> to have you on the network unless you understand this is my job. And, and, and I, I don't want to subject you to this if it's going to upset you or in any way cause you to have a problem. This is what I have to do. Sorry. Not, to, not to come, I have no problem with religious, I have no problem with the preacher across the street or, or this church or that church or the other church, but I have an assignment to tell these who come out and bring a God of a violence and, and a God of money and credit cards and all of this type of thing which has hurt people and put people in such bondage and shake it. That's exactly what Uranus does and that's where I fit into this. It is to shake the status quo and so be it. You know, it's the same as in here. You hear it, you say this is offensive to me, you won't come back. But I can't stop. See? Now, if you organize yourself into a complete established church and you say, he shouldn't do this, we don't need a guy like this around here, then you could vote and you throw me out of here. That's, that's fine, but that's still not going to stop me, because I can't. I just can't. So. You who have come here on Sunday mornings, you've sat through Jesus Christ talking to the most religious people the world has ever known. Sadducees, Pharisees, scribes, these people walked with God, they talked with God, they sang with God, they, they wrote with God, they read with God, everything was God, 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 everything. And what did he call them last week? They were so deeply ingrained in God, he says, you are children of hell. I mean, Jesus says this. And of course, he used that great word, hypocrite, hypocrite. And what did he do? Did he, did he say, well, now, wait a minute. <laughs> you know, I don't, want to, I don't want to offend you. He did want to offend them. He absolutely had to offend them. And when you see a man on television reaching into somebody's pocket, fishing around for a credit card, promising them some kind of a healing, it's your responsibility to offend him. Write him a letter. Do something. Call a station. 
because the problem is these people that are called Christians will sit and not say a word because they don't want to offend brother so-and-so who is nothing but a crook. He's not even a good crook because a good crook will hold you up with a gun and say, I'm a crook. This guy said, I'm a prophet. Say, how many people have gone broke, tithing, giving 10% of what meager little income they had and not have enough money to pay the rent or not have enough money to eat off them? Because of all of this misrepresentation. Here you had it again. They're all was on television all over the place. Do you know how many books these bookstores sold on prophecy? People wanted to go because this was it. This was another Armageddon. They made millions of dollars selling books on prophecies, and it was all bull. Pure, unadulterated bull. Why? Because they took literally that which is a spiritual allegory. And taking it literally, they said, here it is, Armageddon's coming, God's plan is right on time. Then, if God's plan was right on time, God is responsible for Saddam Hussein. Whose side do you want to be on now? Is this the guy that he created to fulfill his book? This is it. This is the word of God. God's plan is right. He's going to create a Saddam Hussein to torture and maim and destroy people so his book comes out right. Well, you know better than that. All this allegory is saying that that war which comes from the north, meaning the emotions, swings down against Israel, which is the spirit and soul of man in harmony with God, and sets out to destroy it. And Armageddon is the fire which comes down from the higher consciousness or heaven and to set you free. It's all inside. But yet they've taken it and literalized it. And do you know what I heard them on Christian television saying the other night? Well, it looks like the war is winding down. Yeah, brother so-and-so, maybe this isn't it. Well, this isn't it this time, but now what we've got to look for is all the Arab nations have got to come together. They've got to be unified and then meet with the Russians. See? And the Russians and all of these Arabs, then they'll come down, and then the great time of the Lord will come. These guys are agitating it. They won't stop until there's a war. They are not waving the banner of peace. They are agitating for a war. The most disappointed people in the world, if there's not a conflagration of a holocaust, they're going to be born-again Christians because they've got to have a bloody war to make their war. Do you know that they're disappointed? Right now, they are disappointed that this didn't explode into a nuclear holocaust because their savior is not going to come back in a hail of bullets this week. Kidding? No, I'm serious. They don't know quite what to say. Now they've got to watch for another war to start. And if one doesn't start, they'll start one. And they started by constantly keeping you looking for something to be fearful of. Keep your watch out for Gorbachev. Watch out for the Russians. Watch out for the Syrians. All of these people. Keeping you agitated against these people. Suspicious of these people. To the point of where we are at now. They sit on television and with their maps looking at exactly when this great holocaust is going to happen. And they don't understand that the holocaust is happening right now. The holocaust is an inner holocaust when the fire, which is the spirit, comes down from heaven, which is the higher mind, and burns up all of the negative garbage that has been put into it. Let me tell you a story about a, a scientist, and this is interesting. His name is Velikovsky. V-E-L-I-K-O-V-S-K-E-Y. Velikovsky. And Velikovsky found that there was a shifting of the Earth's axis. He didn't understand. He said, he's telling me, you know, he says, something strange here. The Earth's axis is shifting back and forth. And he tried to find a reason for this. He couldn't figure out what. But his studies showed him that this was produced not by the Earth, but by celestial vibrations. Something was coming from outer space causing the Earth's axis to shift. The Earth was picking up some kind of a vibration from something. So. And Velikovsky began to study the solar system. And what he concluded was really amazing. He concluded that 
something was connected with the planet Venus and that the planet Venus was once a part of the planet Jupiter and that there had been a collision in the heavens somewhere and a big chunk of Jupiter flew off into space and became the planet Venus. And he said that he was pretty sure that he, on the basis of this, could tell you why the shift in the axis, and he could also pretty much size up the uh, temperature and the atmosphere in Venus and all of this stuff. Well, this took place in the 1950s, and Mr. Velaskovsky, or Dr. Velaskovsky, he was called a heretic. He was severely criticized. He was not allowed to talk on any university, on any campus, because he was a complete nut. He was an absolute nut. Well, Voyager 2, that was launched by NASA, probed Venus, and guess what? Velikovsky was right. They proved Velikovsky right. The guy probably died a pauper, probably lost his job. No, have you ever heard of him? Never heard of him. Here's one guy heard of him. It's a hand for Elliot. <laughs> but I mean, okay, very few people have heard of who this man was. But do you see what I'm saying? What did he have to do? He had to face the establishment. He had to face all of those who had to be right. They couldn't be wrong because they had degrees. They had so many degrees next to their name, they called them Dr. Fahrenheit. They had degrees. They had college experience. They had training in science. This guy was an oddball. He was out of step. He had to be wrong. He was right. And basically, what happened here was Saturn had screamed, Velikovsky, you're a heretic. But Uranus is saying, plug on, man, and upset the status quo. And he did. And that's exactly what Uranus is. Here we are screaming about the New Age, screaming about the inner kingdom, and Saturn is screaming back, you're a heretic, you're a cult leader, you're a Satanist, and all of this stuff. But you know what's right. I, I don't know how many of you saw the board as you came in, but the quote by Albert Einstein, whom you all know, was, I thought, appropriate. Great spirits, said Albert Einstein, have always encountered violent opposition from mediocre minds. Great spirits have always encountered violent opposition from mediocre minds, Albert Einstein. Here's the point. You come in to meditation, whether you come here, which is very good for you, because you then increase the vibrations that you're exposed to, and this room fills with glorious vibrations. You allow yourself in your meditation to be deconditioned from the status quo. That's what it does. You submit your mind to this nothingness, and you become deconditioned to the status quo. When you are deconditioned from the status quo, you become in touch with your own essence. In essence, what it is, you become in touch with your own genius. Say, You, inside of you, genius. Inside of you, knowledge. Inside of you, wisdom. That's what Jesus Christ said. You take away the key of knowledge because you don't enter within yourself. But when you do this, be prepared for judgment. Be prepared for Saturn, and you'll be judged by mediocre minds. You'll be judged to be a heretic. You'll be judged to be a lunatic. You'll be judged to be satanic, an Eastern cult leader, all of the above because of the influence of Saturn. And that's what Saturn is. So it takes a lot of courage to move into the Uranian realm, to get involved with this. It really does. You really got to stick your neck out because you're going to be laughed at, you're going to be condemned, and then one of the things that is very difficult you're going to find yourself alone. All alone. All, see, do you remember what Jesus said? I have not come to bring peace but a sword. How could the Prince of Peace bring a sword? Because peace is a sword. Peace is a sword. Because when you begin to practice the tranquility of nirvana and enter into the deep recesses of absolute peace, you will be separated from your mother and your father, your sisters and your brothers, your church and your friends. They will not even want to hang around with you anymore because peace is a sword and it cuts like a knife through butter and it separates you from all of those who you've loved 
and have been so near and dear to all of your life. And that's basically what it is. Society will not support you. Tradition will be gone. Your own family will be gone. And the Christ in the center of your mind will cause you to be abused. Go ahead. You want to see it work? Go into where you work sometime and start talking about this stuff and see what happens. Tell them that this is Uranus who was castrated by Saturn and actually this is Christ coming back and see what happens to you. Okay. But just when you do that and they laugh at you and call you names, remember this Mr. Velikovsky. You know. Error. Error does not become right just because a lot of people believe in it. That's a good one. I'm going to put that down to the other one that I come up with that night that all we know is what we are told by people who don't know. Error does not become right just because a lot of people believe in it. But what about from our base? Jesus Christ. What did he say? And I follow him. See, this is what really gets a lot of born-again people. They can't deal with this because everything I tell you, I quote Jesus Christ. Say, what are you going to do with that? I don't go off on my own with this stuff. And Jesus Christ says, hey, it is enough for the disciple, you and me, that he be as the master. That's the Christ mind. Be like him. And the servant, you, as his Lord. That's the Christ mind. If they called the master of the house, that's your higher mind, that's the Christ in you, Beelzebul, which means the devil, evil, demonic, satanic, how much more shall they call him of his own? So, in other words, if they are not calling you some crazy name, you can assure yourself you're as lost as you can be. But if the system, if religion calls you satanic, a cult leader, a, a way out, a demonic, you know you're right in line with Jesus Christ. So until you have been called satanic, demonic, and a screwball, you haven't made it. So that means you've got to stand up right where you work, go into your house, go right where all the people that you love in your traditional. Next time you have a Fourth of July party, tell them about Uranus getting castrated, and that's really Jesus Christ coming back, and see how you make it. And when they call you a screwball and a satanic cult leader, you'll know, woo I made it. It's true. It's really true. It's really true. What I wanted to check or look with you with, and I wanted to share something with you. I was born, as that might be a shock in and of itself, but I really was. <coughs> I was born under the sign of cancer. Okay? <coughs> And what I wanted to look at, and we'll start looking at this, and each one of you will have a sign. I'm not going to bring you up and make a fool out of you or anything like that. But I want to look at, and Joan helped us last week, how this change in age and celestial positioning of the universe and all of this stuff is going to affect you. And when I began to read this stuff about me, Joan and I were in Key West at the time, and I said, God. Do you know this guy? Look at this. Some of you here know me. Some of you have been hanging around with me for a long time. Others maybe don't know me that well, but even some of you that haven't been hanging around here too long have gotten a pretty good glimpse of this. But what it says is that Uranus and Cancer people, whoop, P E O, feel, get this one, different. Feel different. There's a gut feeling inside of you that there is something that is not quite what's inside of everybody else. Something strange. I myself spent most of my childhood in a fairly large house with a lot of people in the house, always isolated. Never realized it until in my later years. Whenever you went in the house, there was always a big family, a lot of people around a table, a lot of people sitting in. Aunts and uncles were there and all these people. Had a bunch of drinkers. There was always a couple under the couch or lying next to a coffee table or under a coffee table. Or they were always there, you know. You know, you know in the old days, you always had an Uncle Jim or an Uncle Mike crashed on the floor somewhere. <laughs> and I had my share of those. But amazingly, I was always in a room by myself isolated myself. I spent much of my time 
proving this Uranus and Cancer because I spent much of my time inside of myself. I, I spent just about all of my young life inside of my head having experiences with myself, with my psyche. And I, I really, I didn't know that. I wasn't, I wasn't really hip about meditation or what was going on, but that's what happened. What it says is that when Uranus is in Cancer, there are many people who will begin to examine the causes of their own moods and their feelings. And that's basically how I spent much of my, much of my life. Then I began with Joan, I was reading this, and now listen to this. <clears throat> Many who come into this, is this shifting or is that me? The huh? The All right. You getting in there, you zooming in there once in a while? Yeah, you watching? That's all right, it's good enough. But listen to this. As I, was, as I was reading this, and what we've all been through together, this is what it said. Some people who are in this particular thing that I'm in begin to take interest in ancient or new religious concepts, building cultural bridges, breaking down cultural patterns of religion, and raising consciousness. This symbol is one of free thinking. Now listen to this. These people have an intent to utterly break free from any restrictive belief system that is preventing unchecked discovery of their essential nature. You don't know. You'll never know how many hours, and Joan can tell you in our early days together, how many days I spent in these classical music sessions with the lights down and Tchaikovsky and Wagner, and I would turn these hi-fi sets up to the maximum. And I would be sitting on a couch no further away than she is from me, and the thing would blast, and I would be into oblivion somewhere. You know, if you hear this stuff, and the symbols are crashing and all this stuff, and I would sit there in the dark, and I would come out and I would say to Joan, you know, I just thought of something, and I don't think anybody else realizes this. Remember I used to say that to you? Say, I didn't know I was meditating. I didn't know where I was. I spent endless hours. I mean, people used to come over, you know, when, to parties. I just got out of the Navy, you know, people would come over and young people, they wanted to go out and boogie-loo and all that, and they'd come over and sit down and they're playing Wagner or Haydn or something, you know, and all of this stuff and classical music. And I didn't know what was drawing me in that direction. But it was exactly what this Uranus and Cancer thing says. It's trying to find what it is inside of you, not even knowing you're looking, but I obviously opened the door. And it says that this individual, Uranus and Cancer, desires to throw off these unnecessary amounts of information that have been collected over many years and many lifetimes. You know? Because it's all a bunch of junk piled up on your head, piled up on your head. This is piled up, that's piled up, and finally you start to take the spiritual shovel and dig yourself out from under it all. Because it's done nothing but leave you totally bored. Do you know? I mean, I was just bored. Absolutely bored with being alive. What was the sense of it? All I'm doing is sitting here, eating cookies, getting older, watching idiots on television, and watching life pass me. Didn't have any. Why am I sitting here eating cookies? Why am I sitting here? Why am I? You know, don't you? See, I don't know if the average person goes into that, but that was my whole obsession. What the heck is this all about? And somebody inside was telling me. Yeah. When you come to this new age, all right, you look and you find it biblically described in Romans 12, 2. It says, be changed by a renewing of your mind. Romans 12, 2. Be ye changed by the renewing of of your mind. That's new age. A new mind! How can it not be a new age if you have a new mind? Because if you have a new mind, you're going to think differently than you thought before. That's Uranus. You're sitting here in this room and you're watching this on television for the very same reason it is Uranus vibrating in and out of the channels of your mind, changing you. 
and you have chosen to open yourself to it. That's why it's happening. Cancer relates to the womb. The womb. And to break free from the womb is, is to be very insecure. And you don't want to be insecure. I don't want to let go. I held on to my mother for I don't know how many years. I really did. She and her, my mother and I were great friends. My father was an alcoholic. He used to beat everybody up. So my mother and I used to run off to hide. I told you those stories. We used to run in the park and hide behind trees with this guy. It was like The Shining. Did you see The Shining with Jack Nicholson? Remember he's coming through. Rah, rah. I'm telling I lived it. I lived it. My mother and I used to hide at 2 o'clock in the morning in a park called Elmwood Park in Newark, up uh, East Orange, New Jersey. We used to hide behind bushes and trees, and you could hear this guy drunk going through, shaking the bushes and knocking the trees, trying to find us. Lived the shining, only he wasn't Jack Nicholson, and the pay wasn't any good. It wasn't acting. It was true. So what do you do with the womb? What happens then? I have a need. See, I have to have a lot of support. See, I, I, I can seem very gutsy and very, you know, I'm not really afraid. I, I'll, I, I'm not afraid of anybody, with this, especially with this message. See, but I still have an insecurity that I need. So I've got the right person. Let's jump. See, I have to lean on her. She has to be there. See. Should she replace me with my mother? I'm sure she did. Absolutely. The same security, the absolute same security. I can talk to her and be reassured. Because you know, I don't have anybody else to talk to. And I'm a human being. See, I can go in and I can meditate, but I've got to have somebody to talk to, somebody to reassure me, somebody to show me a way out of a particular thing when I, don't, when I can't see a way. It's very important because I could not do this by, I could not do this by myself. That might surprise you, but without her, I could not, I could not be here. Couldn't do it. So. And... Uh, that's, I think, what makes this so unique, but at the same time, it's a truth, it's a fact. Okay. So that's why I'm very careful about putting my name on things and placing some kind of, oh, this is the Bill Donahue show, or Bill Donahue teaches this and all of that stuff. I, in fact, that's the first time I've ever mentioned my name. I tell them, I wouldn't do it because it's not me. It is, it is Christ, and it is biblical. And these things are real, and these things are true. So when we look at the womb, and, 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 I, and, and, and I need that womb, and so I seek within myself, I, wanna, I wish you, I don't know if you have Bibles with you, but if you do have little ones that we give out here, you should go to page 172 in the New Testament, and the rest of you go to the Second Corinthians, because you should see something, and this tells you about the womb, and why you meditate. Okay. Why you meditate? 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2. This is what Paul says, okay? For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. You see that? I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. You know what that means? That means that your intercourse, which must take place in the upper room, is in virgin consciousness. You can only have an intercourse with Christ when your consciousness is absolutely virgin. Because that which is the new Jesus within you cannot be born other than by a virgin. Christ cannot be born other than by a virgin. So your intercourse must be in a virgin consciousness. I have presented you, espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. This doesn't have anything to do with sex. This has nothing to do with sex. This is using sex allegorically. Your intercourse is of the mind. Your mind must be virgin. That's why you must meditate. You must take no thought. And then what happens to you? Okay, let's say you enter into this conscious intercourse with Christ in the virgin, in the virgin mind. What happens to you? Look at page 215 in those little Bibles in the New Testament. And the rest of you go to 1 Peter and go to chapter 1. That's page 215 in your little Bibles. And the first of you go, uh, first of you, next of you go to 1 Peter, chapter 1, okay? 1 Peter, chapter 1, page 215, verse 23. Being born again, not 
of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible seed, by the word which lives and abides forever. By incorruptible seed. So then, you see, this is, this is the thing. We were talking about this the other night, about the raising of Lazarus. The raising of Lazarus was not the raising of a real dead man. It was the raising of dead spirit. How do I know that? Because the Bible specifically tells you that corruption cannot inherit incorruption. What's the sense of getting some guy out of a grave? However, the beauty of getting you out of your spiritual grave up into heaven consciousness rising to new life, to be born again, not to be any more bondaged into the flesh of the old ways, but to die to the flesh, to be resurrected out of the tomb or the solar plexus and be called by Christ, come out, come out, come out, come out, Lazarus, come out. Okay. Corruption cannot inherit, incor uh, incorruption, that's right, corruption cannot inherit incorruption. So we're talking in allegory. Jesus wasn't around as a magician. He wasn't fooling around. This is, this is real stuff. You know, big people out of graves. That's the whole thing. They say, when Christ comes back, the graves will burst forth and people will come out of the graves. Do you want to be around to see that? <laughs> Uncle Charlie crawling out of the mud? <laughs> Here's some guy staggering down the street. Whoa. I'm Uncle Charlie. Do you know where Aunt Beatrice lives? She didn't get married again. I mean, I'm <laughs> But you see, the point is, the point is that when Christ returns, the graves do bust open. But it's the grave of your own lower mind which has got you dead to the things of God. It bursts open and you crawl out of that grave and you come up into eternal life. Consciousness. I mean, this is a great thing to look forward to. Jesus' second coming. He's going to be an atomic bomb. Half the world's going to get killed in a nuclear holocaust. And then when he gets back, the graves are going to open. Everybody's going to get out. Who wants to go? I know. That sounds like a bad grade B movie. <laughs> nuclear holocaust and everybody climbing out of the cemeteries. How would you like... I mean, can you see yourself driving down the Lacey Road or something, or one of these roads where they have these cemeteries and uh, looking at, uh, did you see something? What the heck is that? There's a hand coming out of here and looking at it. Some guy again. And all these people come walking out. Oh, what a glorious time. You would run. How fast would you run? <laughs> see, you, you have to understand this allegorically. But when this comes back, the graves will burst open that are holding people into the death of the lower mind and they will rise up into the life of the higher mind. How can people be so stupid to take this stuff literally? Do you see how stupid it is? It is stupid, 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 stupid. I'm telling you, there's something. But so there then, you have that question of the womb. So, in other words, as Uranus and cancer revolts or against the system, what's going to happen? And I see it, and I see it, I've seen it happen to me. When you get into this type of a situation and you start a revolution against the system, you know what's going to happen? The system's going to start a revolution against you. You know? You're, you're not going to be one. Don't bring that guy to the party. He's a screwball. He's talking about Uranus and castrating and uh, planets and uh, this is God. I mean, you know, the guy's nuts. So, you know, like, want you. Matthew 28, Jesus says, Fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul. And that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's, that's what he is saying there. They may come after you and hurt your feelings. I mean, he is not saying, don't worry if somebody comes up with a knife and sticks it in you. Something like that's stupid. Certainly you're going to worry about that. Somebody comes in with a gun, you want to fear them. Doesn't mean that. Doesn't mean, don't worry if somebody's trying to kill you, it's okay. No, you worry, run. Call the cops, do something. Worry about it. It's not what it means. It means they'll try to destroy that which is your ego, that which is your peace of mind that which is your understanding of life. and it's, They'll come against you, get you all screwed up. 
but they'll never be able to kill that precious thing which is within you because it's untouched by human hands. It is the temple. It is you. So the systems and the religions, they don't know the power of this. If somebody comes to you and say, why are you doing these things? Why are you doing these things? A religious guy who's had a pastor say, why are you doing these things, Brother Elliot? And he said, well, it's, you don't understand. Uranus is cancer, is in cancer overcoming Saturn. And that's it. Not another word will be said. Say, other than, get away from me. <laughs> because they don't know. They haven't the slightest idea that this has any effect on you whatsoever. And you know the funny part is? They should have an idea. They should know that this has an effect. Why? Because of the fact that the Bible says in Job 38, can you bind the influence of Pleiades? Can you loose the bands of Orient? The Bible says that these things affect consciousness. Yeah, there was an interesting thing. I wanna, uh, we were talking about the gold in the temple a couple of weeks ago on Sunday morning. I said that God is gold. And then Joan Schultz called and she said she looked up in the um, dictionary and looked up the word gold and saw that the symbol was AU. See? And she said, well, you know, that could be like AU ohm, you know, ohm. I said, yeah, but it's not got an EM. But I thought it was good. AU means gold. Saying that's good. But then I looked up M. And M is a symbol of the moon. And the moon means consciousness. Oh, gold, God, mm, moon, consciousness, God, consciousness, oh, you hear? Did I run away from you? Did you hear what I just said? It's in the, that's in the Western Webster's Dictionary. That's in, not in the Kabbalah or something like that. You look it up. AU means gold. In mysticism, gold is God. M means the moon. In mysticism, the moon means consciousness. A-U-M, God consciousness. Oh. Well, why not? Why would it be? Wouldn't it make you think? Who put these letters together? Why did they put an M on here? Why didn't they put a T? It'd be ought. Or a K. Ought. Why did they put an M? Did you know something? Let me show you something that you don't know. Let me show you how important letters are in mysticism. Make sure you come in and out enough now. You come in and out enough? All right. Just, we've got a new camera, man. If you don't like this work, I'm just saying what happens, folks, out there all over the country. If you don't like the cameraman's work, his name is Joey. <laughs> and I'll bring his girlfriend up here, too, so you can identify her. And you can send her cards. Her name is Chris. And say, Chris, that cameraman of yours is a doodle. Uh -huh. She's responsible. <laughs> I'll show you something. Watch this. You remember when Jesus said, it said you may not remember, it was a part when Jesus breathed on the disciples and he said, ah, receive the Holy Spirit. He breathed on them. Ah, receive the Holy Spirit. Let me show you something. Abraham was married to Sarai. Okay? That was their name. You see it in the Old Testament. When they began to follow God spiritually, Abraham's name was changed to Abraham. Sarai's name was changed to Sarah. Look up the letter H. In the dictionary, it means to aspirate. It is breath. It is the Holy Spirit. <sighs> you see? So the name was changed from Abraham to Abraham because he had received the Spirit. Her name was changed from Sarai to Sarah because she had received the Spirit. Okay? And I mean, it's, it's another thing. It's in the dictionary. It's not a big deal. But nobody ever tells you why. Why was his name changed from Abraham to Abraham? Why was her name changed from Sarai to Sarah? Not just because... What the heck? Yeah, I got a Bible. I think I'll change your name. No, because that H means spirit, breath, pneuma. See, spirit is breath. It is the air. It is, it is the life-giving force of God. And so there's, ah, what the heck? You know that. You're not going to make any money knowing that, but I mean, okay. So as we wrap this up, let me show you. The systems and the religions 
not knowing the power of Uranus and so forth and so on, scream against the New Age. And that's what's going on today. They will defend this lunacy out there. Now, hey, the war's over. What about the boys? Welcome them back. Go to the parade. Yes, sir. They did a tremendous job. God bless them. I mean, you, it's not, you see? Nothing wrong with that. At the same time, you're followers of Christ, and you have got to look at the devastation, and you have got to continue to meditate, 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 that this stops. See? Because even though you welcome the boys and you cheer the boys, and all that, you've got to look at the boys over there. Sure, they had some horrors in Kuwait, terrible people, but they weren't all that way. Did you see a lot of them coming out, kissing, you know, prisoners and people strewn on the highways? You see the houses in Iraq, and everybody, devastate, absolute, utter devastation. And so you have to then bring this consciousness which is coming with Uranus, so that stops. Okay. But, but, but the systems, the religions, they don't know that there is such a thing as Uranus. And they don't know why you act the way you do, why you feel the way you do. Because they perceive this as a threat. And what is it a threat again? It's a threat against their traditions. And Jesus Christ said in Matthew 7, 13, you make the word of God of no effect through your traditions. So you are looked at an individual you know, who's out to cause trouble. Most people in this will ignore it. You know what I'm saying to you? There's a lot of people that have this Uranus and Cancer and will ignore it. They'll fight it. They'll get the thoughts, but you know, it's your hunch. Did you ever say, did you ever get a, a feeling? You get it a lot in Atlantic City. Did you go to Atlantic City? Some people go and play the machine, you know, and uh, you turn around, and there's the machine you were going to go over first, and the guy goes and pulls and gets three sevens and walks away with five. You say, oh, God, I should have went over there. Many things that you've done in your life, you say, you know, I, was, I, I should have done this, or I should have invested in this, or I should have bought that, or I should have done this, or whatever, whatever. You know? That's what comes through. That's angel speaking. That's, that's the intuition that comes from the higher mind. See? But most people do not plug into it. But those who do, those who do, when you plug into this, you become a catalyst of agitation to the society, to the system. You can't help it because it's your earnest. Can't help it. So as we wrap it up, you see that in one sign, cancer, Uranus, it manifests what's called the new age. And the system, the religions have no idea whatsoever that this new age is coming as a result of this frequency and a tremendous effect from Uranus. And those who do know will take this and, and become part with it and enter into the, this cloud of unknowing of Christ consciousness and those who don't will be shaken. Next week we'll take a look at Uranus and Gemini. I don't know if you have any here, but we'll look at that. See some beautiful, beautiful things. And watch now as, as we go along and watch the changes. Watch the changes in your own life. Watch things. I don't know how many of you, even since you've been coming here and begin to enter into meditation, have had changes in your life. And sometimes, think, well, the change may be negative. And that might be the most important thing that can happen. Not negative in your life, but a negativity against the path you've been following. Because that path has been wrong. And so what seems as if it's pulling you in a different direction that you don't particularly think is right, turns out to be right. You can't, I had a lady write to me, and she said to me, I cannot understand why there is suffering. I, I meditate. My friends do this, she said, but you sit back and you look and you see all of this suffering. Why? And, and you know, is it's true. Some terrible things happen to people. Why is it happening? But think for a minute. If you are free, and you are not a puppet of some God pulling strings, but if you are totally free, you then have to be as free to choose wrong as you are to choose right. And if you choose wrong, you're going to have suffering. Now you say, but well, I have chosen right all of my life. I go to church, I cook for the kids, I go, but I never did nothing wrong. But you didn't know that I chose wrong. And so one day, 
as you were standing on the street corner, offering psalms to God, waiting for the light to change. I came out of some bar, snockered. Ran my car down the highway, lost control, plowed into a pole, and broke both of your legs. Why are you suffering? Because in my freedom to choose right, I elected to choose wrong. And I caused you to suffer. What's it mean? It means you cannot live in peace and harmony in a society where billions of people are free to choose. You have to work and work and work to change the society. Because unless the society is changed, there will never be an end to it. There are people who are born with serious illnesses because somewhere back in their family tree, it could have been hundreds of years ago back, somebody chose wrong and implanted into the genetic system a horror. Say, it's not a god. So God has nothing to do with it. And so then the, the commission here is for you to choose right by rising up and allowing God to live within you, to come forth and to burst forth with healing. And then to get as many people tuned into this because we create then a vibration of love and a peace. And before you know it, the vibration gets so strong it begins to overwhelm the negative vibrations which are, calling, which are causing evil. It's so simple. But most people would prefer to lie there and blame it on an uncaring God. There is no such thing. There is no such thing. God is not depriving you of anything that he isn't giving everybody else. God is not withholding himself from anybody. But everybody is withholding themselves from him. Jesus Christ sat at the well. That's a symbol of the power that sits deep within you in the desert of your mind, at the well of deep water, waiting for the woman, waiting for the spirit to come and drink. And most of the women never come. One had to leave her five husbands, that's your five senses, go to the well with the water pot. And then he gave her the water. That means you leave the five senses, and in meditation you come to the man at the well, you drink of the deep water, which is the deep truth, and it says she put her water pot, for she would never have to use that again. You would never drink from the lower well. You would never drink from the lower waters because now you have drunk from the living water. But you have to go within yourself to find he who sits at the well. And it's a strange thing, but it's Jacob's well. And Jacob is the one who said, I have seen God face to face, and I will call the place Peniel. Thank you.